اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق Let us take a look at now the fourth property of an ism called Arab. This is unique as far as English speaking students are concerned. As a result, many students claim it's very complex or something they cannot understand. Some even students even give up their Arabic uh, studies as soon as they get to this subject. And even some courses really don't deal with the topic very, very well as they're concerned about spoken Arabic or gaining vocabulary. Whereas Arab is absolutely critical if you want to study Quranic text, hadith or any of the classical texts. Without it, really, you cannot make any significant progress. And inshallah ta'ala, you will see it is really not complex. My humble opinion is just different. And because it's different, you and I find it difficult. Why? Because we're not used to the way Arabic works. Well, alhamdulillah, we are very proficient in the UA. The English works. We can use, we can translate, we can understand without much difficulty. Inshallah ta'ala, very soon, as we follow each lesson, you will see the subject. It is not as complex as many make it out to be. And inshallah, in this session, I'm going to try my level best to introduce the topic to you in a simplified way with comparing and contrast so you can understand it better. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant me tawfiq and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to increase all of us in knowledge. Let us make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal before we begin. Rabbi zidni ilma. Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. So what is Arab? Arab literally in Arabic means to Arabize something. And it is a classical feature of the Arabic language. And it indicates the role, the function that ism is playing in the sentence. And this is Arab. Now what happens between Arabic and English is that in Arabic, nouns decline. What do I mean by declension? Let's take three examples, inshallah, to illustrate this. In the first example, we have the kalima. Well, of course, we all know this, alhamdulillah. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. In the second example, I will say in the shahada, ashhadu. Anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. In the third example, in our salah, we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin. So you can see here the word Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This word here is used in three different ways in Arabic. I have Muhammadun, Muhammadan, Muhammadin. This is what they refer to in the grammar books as declension, i.e., the ending changing. Now, in Arabic, it changes in three different ways. All isms in Arabic will decline. 85% of them will decline exactly the same as way as you see with Muhammadun, Muhammadan, Muhammadin. To illustrate the fact that isms decline in Arabic, I have got some words on the screen for you. So let's take the first one. We have Muslima. So if you were to read it fully with the ending, it will be exactly the same as the word Muhammad. So it will be Muslima Tun. Muslima Tun. And then in the second example, we will have, I'll copy and paste to save time, Muslimatan, and we have Muslimatin. The word Muslim, on the other hand, we will see it will end exactly the same. Muslimun, Musliman, and we'll have Muslimin. So Muhammadun, Muhammadan, Muhammadin, you have Muslimatun, Muslimatan, Muslimatin, Muslimun, Musliman, Muslimin. Now, just for your information, whenever I put the double fatha, Tanween version here, I put an extra alif at the end. It's a writing rule in Arabic. Inshallah, we'll look at it closer later on. Now, the word masjid will be exactly the same. So I'll have masjidun, masjidan. You can have added the uh, alif additional there at the end, which is a writing rule. And we have masjidin. When I have al in front, I will have exactly the same, except for that al removes the tanween uh, from the word. So I'll become al masjidu, al masjida, al masjidi. And this is declension. You see, all words in the Arabic language, 85% of them, I should say, isms, will decline in this way. When, when you have tanween, it will be Muslimatun, Muslimatan, Muslimatin. When you, do, when you put Al in front, which is the in English uh, equivalent to, you put Al Masjidu, 
al masjida al masjidi one of the rules of arabic language you can't have al and tanween together so this is called declension and each declension has a name so muslimatun muslimatan muslimatin muslimun musliman muslimin this is the way 85% of the words or isms in arabic will decline in to indicate the role the function it is playing in the sentence every ism in arabic has arab every single one of them 85% of them will follow the pattern we've already seen Muhammadun, Muhammadan, Muhammadin So let's start with the 85% We will pick up the others later on inshallah In forthcoming lessons Now the word Muhammadun, Muhammadan, Muhammadin And then we've seen other example Muslimun, Musliman, Muslimin Which you can see on the screen And Al Muslimu, Al Muslima, Al Muslimi Two point I mentioned asked you to remember That when Al is added the Tanwin disappears And when is, there is two has on the tanween we add an extra alif now these are three different declensions three different each one is given a name arabic grammar is a science like all other sciences so each one is given a name when it is muslimun it is called rafa when it is musliman it is called nasab and when it is muslimin it is called jar with the al example when it is al muslimu it is called rafa when it is al muslima it is called nasab and al muslimi it is called jar three different names given to the three different declensions now in the grammar books you will find terms used to uh, translate these terms into for example nominative for rafa accusative for nasab and genitive for jar my humble opinion don't even go there because these terms really are very confusing for english speaking students I never came across these terms in my entire life. I went to school in an English speaking environment. I went to college. I went to university in an English speaking environment. And all my life, I worked in a professional ground where I have to write reports and so on and so forth. Never in my life did I have to worry about these terms, nom nominative, accusative, and so on. In fact, I've even asked people who are English speakers, fluent, and they're lifelong English speakers, what do these terms mean? And they did not know. Only those who are fortunate enough to have studied other languages or have studied grammar at advanced level will be able to tell you what these terms are so please do not use these terms because they're not going to shed any light even once you've even understood them or gone to the internet check what they mean and looked at different books you'll be even more confused because they really are not direct equivalent in the arabic language so i'm not going to use any of these terms uh, nominative accusative genitive because most english speakers won't know what they are referring to i'm going to stick with the three terms in arabic rafa nasab and jar. All I need you to remember to help me to teach this subject to you is that when it is Muslimun or Al Muslimu, Un or U, it is Rafa. When it is Musliman or Al Muslima, it is Nasab. When it is Muslimin or Al Muslimi, it is Jar. That's all you need to remember. And again, the basic rules are that every 85% of the isms will do this. So, how do I know Muslimun is in the Rafa status? Because because of the ending has un that is how i know so the sign of being rafa it is un the sign of it being nasab it is an and the sign of it being jar is in again just to illustrate the example with uh, al it'll be u or it will be a And in jar status, it will be E. So that's all you need to know. The sign of being uh, Rafa Nasobar Jar for this 85% only is the, these three. And they're called Rafa Nasab and Jar. So please note this, that 85% will do this. So we'll start our study with this. Inshallah, we'll pick up the other 15% and also the special cases as we go into the lessons further. But for now, every ism will decline. 85% of them de will decline in this way. Muslimun, Musliman, Muslimin, Rafa, Nasab, and Jar. So what do we mean by status or role that a noun plays in a sentence? Like fortunately for us, we have something in English which is similar and inshallah can help us understand what is the role play in a sentence. Let's take a look again. Imagine you're my English teacher and I present the following to you. His came to me. I gave he him result. His came to me. I gave he him result. Of course, you're going to put a big cross on my 
uh, writing and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. I accept that. The question my, I have for you, why is it wrong? Of course, he, him, and his is referring to the same person. The person is the same. It could be Hamid, it could be Zaid, it could be Helen, it could be whatever. It could be John, Peter, whatever. But the person is the same. So what's wrong with me saying his came to me? I gave he, him result. What's wrong? There's absolutely nothing wrong with it as far as I'm concerned. He will say no. In English, we have different types of pronouns. Now, there are many types of pronouns in English. I've given you three here. We have what's called the subject pronoun, he. he. We have also the object pronoun, him, her. And we have the possessive or the adjective pronoun, his, her. Again, you've got full examples there. So in English, we have three different pronouns depending on the role that the pronoun is playing in the sentence. He, him, and his. You can see three different pronouns are used in the sentence and they need to be used correctly. So if you go back to my uh, English text, his came to me. The sentence here is actually looking for a subject. The sentence is looking for a subject. So I could say, for example, Hamid came to me. Hamid came to me. So he's looking for a subject. So the only correct one to put here is he, because that is the subject pronoun. Then he came to me. I gave. Now here we are looking for an object. I need an object here. The sentence requires an object. I gave. I gave who? And the subject can be only correct if I put here him. So I'm looking for object here and the him is the object version. And then here I'm looking for possessive. Here I need a possessive version whose result? His result. Okay, so I only correct one will be his results. So he, the subject pronoun, came to me. I gave him the object pronoun and his result, the possessive. So again, you can see in English, I make a complete mess if I use the wrong pronoun in the wrong place. In Arabic, this is what declension is. Depending on the role that the ism is playing, you have to say either Muslimun, Musliman, or Muslimin. Putting the wrong ending in the wrong, um, wrong place will completely alter the meaning. In most cases, it will not make any sense whatsoever in Arabic. So exactly the same as with the pronouns in English, where the pronouns change. In Arabic, nouns decline 85% of them in the way to indicate whether it is a subject, for the sake of example here, or is the object, or it's the possessive. And this is what Arab is. Arab is the role, the function that ism is playing in the sentence. We've mentioned that Arab is really the function, the role the ism is playing in the sentence. In order to illustrate how an ism plays different roles in a sentence, let me share with you a story about Hamid the genius. Now, Hamid, he is a genius. He likes to invent things. One day he decided he's going to build himself a car, a noble cause. This car was going to be used for, by him to drive to the mosque on, in the weekends. So he gathered some old parts together, bought some new parts and started designing and building a specific car for driving to the masjid. As he was finishing the car, his grandfather was visiting. He looked at his car and he said, what is this for? He said, oh, I built this car to drive to the mosque. His grandfather very impressed with the design and the technology of the, uh, of the car. He said to him, look, I think the tank that you've got, the fuel tank is too small. It's not going to get you to the mosque. Hamid being a genius, of course, didn't pay much attention to his grandfather. So let us pick up the story from there. So Hamid, once his car was ready, he was driving to the mosque. So Hamid was driving to the mosque. In our first sentence, Hamid was driving to the mosque. In the second, we have Hamid's car ran out of fuel. So as he was driving to the mosque, before he got to the masjid, the car stopped. He could not move anymore. Of course, he's in a state of panic. How is he going to get, how, how going to, get to the masjid on time to reach the Salah for Zuhr? And he was panicking. Unfortunately, Alhamdulillah, his grandfather was driving past. He saw Hamid stranded and his grandfather decided to give Hamid a lift. Now, in these three sentences, I hope you can easily see we're talking about the same person, Hamid, the genius. Hamid was driving to the mosque. In the first sentence, Hamid is doing the role of the subject or the doer. In the second sentence, Hamid is not the doer. He's not doing the thing that is mentioned in the sentence. Hamid is the possessor of the car. It is the car that has run out of fuel. It is Hamid who owns the car. So Hamid is the possessor. In the third sentence, Grandad is doing the act of giving a lift. And it is Hamid that has received the act. So Hamid is now the object. So in these three sentences, we have 
Hamid playing three different roles, even though, of course, he is the same person. But the role that he's playing, the word ism, uh, the Hamid, the ism is playing is different. Now, if we were to do the same thing in English with pronouns, in the first one, I would have to say he was driving to the mosque. In the second one, I'd have to say his car ran out of fuel. In the third one, I'd have to use him. Granddad gave him a lift. So with the pronouns, you can see I have to use the correct one because a sentence in the first one is requiring a subject. Only he will do here. Him or his will be incorrect. If I were to say him was driving to the mosque, that would be completely wrong. Or uh, he car ran out of fuel. Completely wrong. His car. Granddad gave he a lift. Again, would be wrong. Granddad gave him a lift. So in English, I have to change the pronoun to meet the role, the function, the ism or the noun in this case, or the pronoun is playing in the sentence. In English, if I was to use the word Hamid, there is no change in the word, only with the pronouns. So what happens in Arabic? In Arabic, we have the same thing which we've learned, alhamdulillah, so far. We've known that there are three Arab or three statuses. First one, we have Rafa, which is Muslimun, Nasab Musliman, and Jar Muslimin. We can do exactly the same with Hamid, Hamidun, Hamidan, Hamidin. So when I need to use the doer version in a sentence, I have to use Hamidun. When I need to use the object version, I need to use Hamidan. And for example, when I need to use the possessor version, I will use Hamidin. I hope you can see that inshallah three different ones need to go. Now, if I were to use the Arabic words here in these sentences with the word Hamid, I was to replace them. Which version would I use where? So let's take a closer look at the sentence again. Hamid is the doer in the first sentence. In the second one, Hamid is the possessor. In the third one, Hamid is the object. Of course, granddad is the doer in the first one. So which version of Hamid will I use in the first one? I hope you can quickly guess which one is it? Hamidun. Which one will I use in the second one? I would have to use Hamidin because it is the possessor version that I need. In the third one, which one will I use? I would have to use Hamidan. So depending on the role that it needs to play in the sentence, the sentence will require three or the different versions. Either it will be Hamidun, Hamidan, Hamidin. So in Arabic, it is the ending of the word that is telling us who's doing what in a sentence or what the noun or the role that the noun is playing in a sentence. And this is Arab. Arab tells us the role, the function that is being played in the sentence. So let's quickly look at what happens in the English language. I have an English sentence in front of you here, which you can see, Zaid ate the mango. I hope this, there's not, nothing complex here, very simple English sentence, and you can work, it out, work out what's going on in the sentence. Zaid is doing the act, or has done the act in the past tense. Zaid is the doer of the sentence. And the mango is the, the, actually the object, the thing that has been eaten. So if we have here, for example, Zaid. Zaid is doing the act or has done the act, so he is the doer. And the mango is the object. Of course, the verb is ate. Now, if I wanted to change the word order around in English, I'll keep the verb the same. Eight. I put the word order differently. So I say here, the mango. Eight, Zaid. Now I hope you can easily recognize by changing the word order around in English, I've completely changed the meaning of the sentence. So when here we have the mango is the, actually the doer of the sentence. Verb, of course, is still the same. And Zaid is the object. So here, instead of saying that Zaid at the mango, I'm saying the mango at Zaid. Again, the meaning of the sentence has completely changed. So in English, the word order tells us the function, the role that the, sen the word is playing in the sentence. In Arabic, it is the word ending, which we've already seen. So you can see here, Alhamdulillah, that in English, we have a very simple way of doing things. We have the doer followed by the verb, then the object. This is generally a very strict rule in the way sentences are structured in English. So what happens in Arabic? In Arabic, it is the Arab, the ending that tells us what's going on in the sentence. So we have again illustrated the two words here. We have Hamid and we have Zaid, name of two persons I'm sure you know. And we have them in three different versions. Hamidun, Hamidan, Hamidin. Zaidun, Zaidan, Zaidin. 
Rafa Nasabenjar. This bit, inshallah ta'ala, by now I'm sure you have got. Now, in, imagine I wanted, wanted to say in Arabic that Hamid helped Zaid. So I want to say in Arabic, Hamid helped Zaid. The word for help in Arabic is Nasara. Nasara. I'm going to highlight that in red just to make sure that it's clear that it is a verb. So we have Nasara. Who's, who's done the act of helping? Well, it's Hamid. So Hamid has done the act of helping. So we're going to put Hami. Hamid. Let me change the color. So you have Hamid, but he's done the act. So I need the doer version. Do doer version is Hamidun. And then who did he help? Zaidan. So let's put Zaid here. Zaid. Zaid is now the object in the sentence. Hamid helped Zaid. So I have to turn, put the ending, correct ending here, Zaydan. Let me do them in two different colors so it's very clear. So you can see here now, Hamid helped Zaid. How do I know? Because of the ending. Just to illustrate the point, if I were to change the word ending around and I were to say Hamidan, and I change it to Zaydun, now the sentence meaning has completely changed. Now I've got Zaid helped Hamid. So you can see here now, it is the word order in English, but in Arabic, it is not the word order primarily telling me what's going on. It is the ending of the word. And that gives us a lot of flexibility in the Arabic language. In English, we've got the subject, the verb, the object. In Arabic, I can move things around completely. Let me illustrate that for you. So I'll just copy the word Nasara, which is the verb. I've got Nasara, Zaidun, Hamidan. Now play, take a look here. I've got the word order in completely different way, yet the meaning is exactly the same. Zaid helped Hamid. Let's do another version, inshallah, of the same sentence. I've got Zaidun, Nasara Hamidan. I'm just copying paste just to save time. So inshallah you can see here Zaidun Nasara Hamidan. Nasara Zaidun Hamidan. Nasara Hamidan Zaidun. In all three examples, the ending on the two nouns to isms is exactly the same. Therefore, the translation is exactly the same. Zaid helped Hamid. So in Arabic, it is the word order. And this is what gives Arabic languages flexibility. So you can move the subject around, you can put the object first and so on and so forth and move the order of the words and then you build different types of sentences and of course there are subtle differences between each type which we will look at in the advanced lessons. And in the Quran this is used very very uh, miraculously inshallah ta'ala you'll see how the word order is structured in the Quran but before that stage you need to understand this. So in summary in English the word order will tell us who's doing what in Arabic it is the ending, the Arab, that will tell us who's doing what. How do I know? Because of the ending, 85% of them, dun, dan, or din, as in Zaidun, Zaidan, Zaidin, Muslimun, Musliman, Muslimin. Rafa, so far we know it is for the doer or the subject, and Nasab is for the object, and we've seen Jar example with it being in the possessive. This is it. This is Arab. If you can get your head around that, inshallah, ta'ala, we're going to be looking at this subject in detail. But this is the most important aspect of Arab. And there are essentially only three, Rafa, Nasab, or Jar. In order to help you remember the three Arabs with the word example for the 85%, my teacher taught me these three sentences very early on in my studies. And I found them very, very beneficial. Now, the three sentences we're going to say in Arabic are number one, a Muslim came. Number two, I saw a Muslim. And number three, I greeted a Muslim or I gave salam to a Muslim. Now, if you look at the first sentence only in English, I hope it's very clear that a Muslim came. The word Muslim is now playing the role of the doer. Who's done the act? Who came? A Muslim came. So in this instant, I have to put the word Muslim. Muslim. Let me change the color. 
So I have to put this word in the doer version. Doer version of that is Rafa Muslimun. Muslimun. It has to be Muslimun because he's the one who's done the act of coming. In the second sentence, I have Ra'aitu, I saw. Who did I saw? Who's the doer here? I. Because who, who saw? I saw. So the object of my seeing is Muslim. So in this sentence, I have to put Muslim, but this the word Muslim has to be now in the object version. Object version is Nasab. I hope you can remember that. And that will have to be Musliman. I hope you can see that, inshallah. Ra'aytu Musliman. I saw a Muslim. Why? The word Muslim is playing the role of an object. In the third example, the word Muslim here is not playing the role of the object. I gave salam is coming after a word called to in english to ala so anytime it comes a word a, after a word like ala there are 17 of them but we'll use ala as our example it will be in jar status so it will be musli min so i so i gave salam to a muslim salam to ala muslimin please memorize these three sentences write the english and the arabic and note the three Arab, Rafa, Nasab, and Jar. And this will help you, inshallah ta'ala, in remembering the subject of Arab and also beginning to use them in sentences and phrases. So let's quickly recap. We have three sentences here. A Muslim came, Ja'a Muslimun. Why Muslimun? Because it is the doer. In the second, Ra'aytu Musliman. I saw a Muslim. Why Musliman? Because it is the object. And the third one, Salamtu ala Muslimin. Why Muslimin? Because it's coming afterwards like Allah. These three sentences in Arabic and English, inshallah, will give you a summary of all the Arab subject that we've discussed so far. I hope and I pray that I have been able to demystify the subject of Arab, that it is not complex, it is not impossible. Inshallah, very soon you'll get used to the subject. So just to summarize what we have discussed so far, most importantly, there are only three types of Arab. As far as categories are concerned, it will be either Rafa, or nasab or jar and we're going to use the rafa version as our default but for now rafa nasab or jar when is it rafa well to remember it i've given you the sentence ja a muslimun a muslim came doer and then we have ra'aytu musliman musliman nasab state when it is the object and the third Salam to Allah, Muslimin, when it's coming after a word like Allah, which is a preposition. So this is the summary of what you need to, to recall as far as the subject of Arab is concerned. In order to completely demystify the subject of Arab, this table, inshallah, has got a summary of everything I've discussed with you so far. What I'd like you to do is, if you can, take a picture of it or even better, redraw it in your notebooks, inshallah, using your hand. Do not rely on the computer. This will help you retain the information longer, inshallah. So in summary, there are only three Arabs, Rafa, Nasab, or Jar. How do I know it's Rafa? Un or U if I put Al. How do I know it's Nasab? An or A if I put Al. And how do I know it's Jar? In or E if I put Al. Our three sentence example to illustrate, Ja a Muslimun. Why am I saying Muslimun? Because it has to be the doer version here. Ra'aytu Musliman. Why Musliman? because the object it needs to be the object version here salam to ala muslimin any word coming afterwards like ala has to be in jar status and it is in that indicates in this case so this is a summary of all the subjects we discussed in arab of course it's a very detailed subject inshallah ta'ala throughout this course i'm going to give you all that you need to know about arab because without it really you will not be able to make even the first few sentences in the quran you will not be able to translate so we will do study this subject in detail in this course but this sheet inshallah summarizes all the important aspects of Ar arab and i hope and pray i've been able to demystify it for you and it is not as complex as many people make it out to be now in the books you'll find nominative accusative and all of these things in my humble opinion they will confuse you more unless of course you've already studied in detail that's a different subject and of course once you start using uh, the Arabic terminology, you'll get used to it. You know, some people, even my students have given me examples of smiling, frowning and all of the things. OK, these things will may help. But really, it is the role that you need to understand. And if you just sit back and look at the English sentences and try to figure out who's doing what in the sentence, what is the noun doing in the sentence, then that will help you identify the Arab that you need to use. And then 85 percent of them is very easy 
Muslimun, Musliman, Muslimin. Alhamdulillah, this is your brief introduction to Arab, uh, and I hope and pray, inshallah, it is of benefit for all of us. Let's conclude now, summarize the four properties of an ism. Every ism has these four properties, and without really knowing these four properties, you will not be able to make a single sentence in Arabic, nor will you be able to translate an Arabic sentence from Arabic to English. Uh, or use them in any meaningful way without knowing four things. Just like the English examples I gave you earlier, when I say she are books, a complete mess in the English language, we don't want to do these things, inshallah. So we're going to approach the subject of studying Arabic in a very methodolog methodological way, very systematic way, so that we can cover the most essential foundations first. And that's why the first few lessons, inshallah, uh, we'll have a lot of theory, maybe boring at times, but don't worry, inshallah. Very soon you'll see the practical reason, uh, practical nature of the methodology I'm using with you because I want to build a solid foundation first. So bear with me as I go through each lesson, inshallah. But this is what we're going to be discussing. So in the next lesson, we're going to be looking at definiteness. I've already mentioned there's only two options, definite or indefinite. Ma'rifatun or nakiratun. In the lesson after, in the third lesson, we're going to look at gender. Uh, every ism will have to be treated either as masculine, mudhakkarun, or mu'annathun, feminine. In terms of number, every ism will either be singular, mufrad, or muthanna, dual, or jama. And Arab now, alhamdulillah, you know, muslimun, musliman, muslimin, rafa, nasab, or jar. Every ism will have these four properties. And it is only when you know, master these four properties, how to identify them, how to use them in the sentences, inshallah, you will fly through the Arabic language. Please note one thing which I did not tell you and I'll share it with you. In English, you're primarily uh, relying upon the meaning of the word. To know the meaning, to give you these three properties that we looked at. In Arabic, Alhamdulillah, in most cases, not all, in most cases, you will be able to tell the four properties just by looking at the word without having to worry about the meaning. So even though you might not know the meaning of the word, you'll be able to tell whether it is rafa, nasab or jar, whether it is singular, dual or plural in most cases, or is gender, masculine or feminine, or is definiteness, definite or indefinite, just by learning the basic rules. This will help you, inshallah ta'ala, especially when you come to Quranic text with words that are not often repeated in the Quran, which it will help us to identify. Of course, once we begin to learn a bit more, we'll be able to recognize whether it's an ism, fa'il, or a harf very very easily so that's your introduction to the four properties inshallah from next lesson we're going to go into each one in detail definiteness lesson two gender lesson number three number lesson number four and of course all the four properties will be then discussed in every lesson afterwards inshallah as we begin to use them in our studies finally let me introduce you to the muslim table in this table you've got 18 boxes which you can see inshallah you can take a word like muslim and make 18 words from it very easily we will do that by the first four lessons and you will not only do that you will also make another version of the same table the definite uh, with al with it and that will give you 36 words this will help you recognize thousands of words in the arabic language so let's look at this word muslim which has no ending at the end if i want to use the word muslim in the rafa version i will say muslimun nasab musliman and muslimin we've also been introduced to the fe female version of the word muslimatun rafa muslimatan and muslimatin so six words you can do that alhamdulillah many many words as we progress to the course for example if i were to give you the word mu'min mu'min means believer mu'minun a believer mu'minan mu'minin and then we have mu'minatun mu'minatan mu'minatin so six words you can form very easily as we progress through the subject inshallah so this is your muslim table the first row has singular second row will have your duals and the third row will have your plurals again 18 words inshallah from which you're going to learn a huge amount of arabic alhamdulillah we've reached the end of lesson number one in which we looked at the four properties of an ism as an overview in particular we took a closer look at arab inshallah using the knowledge of we have gathered in this lesson and in the next lesson, we're going to be looking at one of the four properties in more detail, definiteness, using our knowledge of Arab and definiteness. In the practical session of lesson number two, we will begin to form sentences and descriptive phrases in Arabic just by learning two lessons. Alhamdulillah. I hope and pray that you're finding this approach beneficial. 
Again, please do give us feedback. If there are any errors we seek Allah's forgiveness, please do let us know. We will try to correct them in the forthcoming lessons. Most important part, uh, person in this course is you. If you're learning through this online learning method, Alhamdulillah, all our work has been of, uh, of purpose. But if you're not learning, then this is an exercise in futility. So please do share your feedback with us. If you're finding these lessons beneficial, do please share them with the Ummah, with your family, with your friends, with your contacts, and encourage as many people to join this program so we can begin to learn to understand Quran in Arabic. Please do share and subscribe also, as others will also benefit from you sharing and subscribing as well. Again, I finalize by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive any mistakes and also Allah to reward all the people who have been helping me in the background to produce these lessons and who have been giving me technical support and many other support and assistance. I cannot thank them enough. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them with the very best in this world and in the hereafter. And may Allah bless you for taking part and also participating in the lessons. I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. الذي علم بالقلم <تصفيق>